Religions. There's a bunch of them, and it's time to rank them in the only objective way possible, a tier list. I will take into account as many things as possible here, so that it isn't just a direct buff comparison of each religion, but also everything from decisions available to them, to unique events, to unique mechanics, or even unique triggered modifiers and promise modifiers. We will also be assuming we're playing optimally, although this will mean that some deviation will occur between things good for single player and things good for multiplayer. With that said, something I'm not going to be taking into account is the difficulty in getting set religion, as that is also something that is very subjective and can end up disproportionately messing with the rankings. Furthermore, the temporal availability of each religion will also not be considered, as it's a bit unfair to try and rank something like Sikh to Catholic when Sikhism hasn't been invented yet. Furthermore, with religions that a lot of countries follow, for example Catholic, it's better to also be Catholic so that you have a higher base relations for things like alliances and avoiding coalitions. However, this is something that I'm going to be also ignoring from the rankings, but it's something you should be considering for your own games. Right, with all that said and done, before we begin for real, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to do the usual stuff. A like on the video would be appreciated, and if you want to subscribe, that would be amazing. But with enough self shilling out of the way, let's get into the video proper. And we're going to begin with... Alcharinga, one of the relatively newer religions, uh, mainly found within Australia in the practical sense, but I think it's a bit unfair to mark them down because of the awful region they're found in. The issue, of course, is... A lot of their buffs are kind of tied to being in the awful region. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at Algeringia proper. Let me open up my notes. So, you begin with plus one dip rep and minus five shock damage received. Not exactly great buffs to start with just as your default. An extra dip rep point doesn't really hurt if you're going for any kind of vassal build, that I, cannot, that I will concede. Otherwise, I find a dip reputation from a religion kind of weak in the grand scheme of things, especially in multiplayer and single player as well because I find that I tend to use Vassals a lot less than the average person. However, it's still there if you want to use it. Minus 5 shock damage received is also in a weird state, where minus 10 will be something to consider, but minus 5 is just a relatively small number. So unless you're specifically stacking shock damage received, I find this buff to be quite disappointing, to be honest. With that being said and done, the main point of Alcharinga isn't actually the default buffs, it's the cults it has access to in the same way that fetishists also get access to a decent chunk of cults. And the cults here are certainly not bad. The main point that I think is the, the highlight of it is the Rainbow Serpent cult, which requires you to unlock every other cult to unlock, giving you plus three mana, plus one monthly admin, dip, and mill, which is by far one of the most powerful cults or bonus in the game. The issue is getting this bonus. It's quite difficult. So some of the requirements to unlock the other cults are reasonable. You need to get 90% naval force limit or accumulate a rival. That's fine. The issue with that cult in specific, I find, is you need to get every other cult unlocked, and some of the other ones are quite annoying. For example, you need to become the strongest trade power in Australia. That's an issue to do, because that means you're either starting in Australia, or you're having to go out of your way to conquer Australia. Another one requires you to straight up own Tasmania, which again is quite difficult to do if you're not starting in Tasmania. If you're starting as a custom nation in, say, England, you're not going to be getting that cult unlocked for a while. And that really holds it back. In general, I like to not rank religions in this tier list based upon the value of their regions, for example, just because some religion is tied to a region that tends to underperform in, in general as the game goes on, it's not the religion's fault that the region is weak. But this religion directly requires you to own specific regions that are inherently weak. And for that reason, I think that's going to knock it down quite a bit. The thing with Alcharinga is there are a lot of things that make Australian natives exceptionally weak. Alcharinga is not one of them. When you take a step back from what the bonuses of Alcharinga actually are, they tend to have quite a decent roster in that regard. We have access to dev costs and construction costs by one of the cults. We have access to a colonist and global settlers if that's something you're up to. You even have access to minus five CCR, as well as for the MP enjoyers and your combat, you have access to both 10 morale of armies and five movement speed, or five discipline if you're doing both a discipline or morale speed, no, morale build. This is quite good as it gives you the flexibility for your military buffs, and those military buffs are quite substantial. It's not like 2.5 discipline or five morale, which can be safely ignored for the most part. 10 morale or 5 discipline is not something you would scoff at. If you're also doing a naval build, you have access to a naval combat bonus of own coast, which is quite strong in my opinion. So overall, if you're looking at it from a point of view of just a pure religion for both single player or multiplayer, it's actually quite decent religion. Again, for your single player blobbing, on top of the things previously mentioned, you can even grab an extra missionary and minus two unrest. Both excellent things to pick up in a religion, and you have access to all of them without your ringer. The problem is, is that even though the bonuses aren't great, some of the best ones, your plus three monarch points, require you owning land in Tasmania, and at the same time you can't be exactly running a lot of those bonuses at the same time as you can be doing with other religions. 
So for that reason alone, and also the region locking of our Turingia behind being on Australia, even though I'd love to rank this religion quite highly, because after all, plus three mana points is hard to replicate in many other religions or bonuses of that caliber. Unfortunately, due to those local location limitations, I'm going to have to be putting it near the end, near the top of beta. But we'll see, there may be some other choices, we'll end up moving it eventually. The actual positions within the tiers, I want to be clear, isn't as set in stone as the actual tiers themselves. Anyway, enough disclaimers in the middle of the each explanation, let's move on. And we're moving on from Alcharinga into Anglican. Oh, Anglican, what's not to love? So you start with minus 10 dev cost and minus 5 tech cost. I like dev cost, especially within a religion in this in this fashion that's just been given to you by default. Dev cost is great in multiplayer and has a space in single player. In single player, you end up deving an institution quite frequently and therefore having access to that dev cost to help you dev the institution is not something I would like to dismiss. It can also be quite useful to get a couple of extra dev clicks to get your crown land into a reasonable number. And in general, I tend to value dev cost even in single player, although I know that that's not the most popular opinion. Tech cost, however, is just useful everywhere. It's 5%, but it's not to be scoffed at. It helps you pay techs early when you need them. It helps you catch up on techs if you're behind. It's just nothing to complain about there. The thing is with, of course, Anglican is it just keeps getting better. It's part of the Catholic group, so much like every other Catholic, you have access to the excellent set of Catholic events that are associated with that religion, which can be a significant buff if you know how to use them. You have access to the Catholic decisions of Sunday schools and other mechanics, although I believe that specific one is tied to Catholics, so it shouldn't be considered with Anglicanism. And of course, you have access to personal unions, which is going to be everyone who is in the Christian group. Personal unions are a mechanic you should not be dismissing, especially if you're playing within that religious group, because it allows you to basically kill really big nations for the purpose of a world conquest in just one or two wars, if you're able to get that restoration of union CB on them. So I think it's a powerful mechanic that should not be dismissed, although it's certainly less useful in multiplayer. However, Anglican definitely makes up for its less usefulness in multiplayer. Now, there's very little in the way of military buffs. In fact, there's only one militarizing religious icons for 10 morale of damage and minus 10 shock damage received, which isn't inherently bad. You'd still take 10 morale of armies and minus 10 shock damage received, but that's kind of it. You have no other access to discipline from this religion. You have no other access to map power from this religion. So that's something to bear in mind. That's, I think, what's really holding it back from the STS is the lack of military buffs, especially from that multiplayer point of view. From a single player point of view, it also doesn't contain a lot of the things that you'd associate with an excellent blobbing religion. It doesn't have any CCR, it doesn't have any province war score cost, it doesn't have anything of that nature that will really help you blob. It doesn't have much in terms of unrest reduction as well. Although what it does make up for is this incredible flexibility in terms of what it actually provides you. 0.25 ducats from Grunting Monopolies is amazing, which also gives you mechanicalism. You can also colonize a lot faster with the port of heretics, you can get innovativeness gain and gain some free development. And most importantly, and I think that's really what makes it a top tier religion, single player, and also quite useful multiplayer, is that if your stability is less than 3, you can spend 200 of the power points to just gain a stability as well as some legitimacy. That is quite strong, as this, mean, as this stability cost is not tied to any overextension or any other modifiers that you may have, allowing you to kind of offset that, both for multiplayer, if you're getting stamped out of a war, you can stay in a war longer, or in single player for when you are 20,000 overextended and your stab cost costs you like 600 admin that's going to save you quite a bit of stability and some admin in the long run for that i'm going to be valuing anglican quite highly i think my issue with anglican is the lack of military buffs for multiplayer and the lack of well too many blobbing buffs for single player in the sense of ccr and other reductions are going to be holding out of s tier but for me anglican sits very firmly near the top of a tier with that we move on to animus Oh, Animist. Who doesn't love Animist? Well, most people actually. Animist is probably one of the least worked on religions in the entire game. Um, your main bonus is your main religion bonuses of plus one tolerance of true faith and minus one unrest. Meaning if you work really hard and do a one faith with Animist, you get minus two unrest in every province. That's pretty much it. Um, in fact, that is it. You are a pagan group, so you also have access to the pagan set of monuments. I haven't really talked about monuments so far. Alchuringa gets access to nothing specific, and of course, Anglican gets access to the Christian monuments, but nothing too outstanding there, just an extra little mini buff. With Animist, you get access to the pagan monuments, so you get some of the oddball monuments like Stonehenge or the pyramids, and not that many unique monuments outside of Africa that you actually have access to as Animist, and that's pretty much it. Now, I mean, the main buff that you get, the largest number in your religion, is that other religions get two local missionary strength against you, but that's about it. So in essence, you're just very easy to flip out of. There's basically nothing going for you if you're an animist, and for that reason I'm going to be putting you firmly into D tier. You're pretty much the definition of D tier. After animists, we move on to Catholics. Now Catholics is pretty much the opposite of animists. 
because I think uh, it's, in terms of mechanics, they're probably the most rich mechanic-wise in the entire game. They're deceptively simple with their default buffs of plus one tolerance of true faith and a mission strength versus heretics, but dear god do they just win in terms of unique mechanics. So first things first, let's talk about the Pope. You have access to the Papal Interactions that got recently buffed. You're also able to grab things like the Curie Controller for a wonderful list of buffs. You can go into Crusades that give you military buffs like manpower, recovery, as well as morale. For that reason, I told it quite well. With Catholics also, you tend to get the early construction cost if you go for it, which is quite nice. You can get some dip annexation cost, uh, which is excellent. And again, having Curia Controller means that for the early game in single player, you also have the AU reduction. It's just wonderful in that case. For your multiplayer, you have access to both morale from the paper interactions, as well as morale from Crusades. And on top of all of that, you also have access to a long list of wonderful decisions. Things that give you an extra missionary and other things like that. You can also pick up a whole bunch of missionary strengths around 3%, I believe, just from your decisions alone when those become available to you. It's a really wonderful religion. And the other thing that's quite amazing with it is that in multiplayer, what happens is not everyone stays Catholic. They do tend to flip out of it. What that means is the few countries that do stay Catholic tend to have a much easier time having a, a grasp on the Pope. The other thing with Catholic as well is that in, in this weird case with other people flipping out of it, you become stronger because you have easier access to the Pope. And I think that's something to bear in mind is that in single player this kind of happens again. As you're killing all the other Catholics, because you're the last remaining Catholic, you have a much easier time just, you know, using the Pope as well. You've got rid of the other Catholics so they cannot compete with you the Pope. So in both cases, over time, it becomes easier and easier for you to maintain the stranglehold of the Pope. The other thing that just has to be mentioned as well is the Holy Roman Empire. If you want to do anything with the Holy Roman Empire before the wars of religion occur in the 1550s, you have to be Catholic because you have to be Catholic to get elected and not being a Catholic makes your time just being in the empire quite literally painful. You decrease the, if you have a heretic prince in the empire, that decreases the imperial authority. So you have access to the HRE mechanics and you have everything that's going for you. I mean, even if you're a colonial person, you have access to the Treaty of Tordesillas mechanic to get more global settlers on places you already have a colonial nation. Basically, it's just win-win-win all around. Whatever you tend to be doing, there's a Catholic buff for you. So for that reason, and even though there are certainly some limitations to Catholics, I think I'm not going to be too controversial here when I'll be putting the Catholics as our first contender for the S team. After Catholic, we move on to Confucian. So Confusion on its own gives you some tolerance of heretics, which means that your heretics to Confusion aren't that amazing. And you get some admin tech cost. Unlike the minus 5 tech cost, it's specifically on admin. So it's, I valued a bit less than the general minus 5 tech cost, but it means your admin techs are a bit cheaper. You can get your ideas a bit faster. It's nothing too excessively special. The main thing with Confusion, of course, is the harmony mechanic. Now, unlike some other mechanics, for example in Karma, there's nothing stopping you just stacking harmony and having 100%. It's not like with karma where having too much karma can actually be a bad thing and you'd have to do a micromanaging act. Harmony is good, the more you get of it, the better. And that's, I think, where the real parts of this religion come in, is the effects of harmony. You're able to pick up an extra minus 10 dev cost, three tons of the true faith, which is quite impressive, if you especially go for a one faith. A very impressive minus 0.5 yearly corruption, which can really help you when you're going overextended and that corruption starts to tack up. Once your corruption's above the plus one yearly from being overextended, you're going to just gaining it even though you're max rooting it out. So that minus 0.5 yearly corruption can be quite useful, especially in a single player context. You also pick up some yearly meritocracy, which is kind of useless unless you're the emperor of China, as well as some legitimacy and yearly devotion. With that though, I have to mention that if you do have your harmony low, you're actually going to get debuffs. So that's something you do have to bear in mind, keeping your harmony low gets rid of your buffs as well as giving you debuffs. So that's something you should be bearing in mind. And in general, I'm a bit skeptical of religions that can give you debuffs potentially. It's a lot stronger when you don't have to worry about debuffs. Because when you have debuffs or when you're doing badly, it makes it harder to come back. But having buffs when you're doing well is all well and good. But the issue is with the religion, another thing you have to bear in mind is it has to support you when you're doing badly. And when you're doing badly with Confucian, you end up getting punished for it. You're getting extra stab costs, you're getting some extra yearly corruption, you're getting some their legitimacy decreases. It's not too substantial, but it's certainly there, and it can be more of another kick when you're down mechanic, and for that reason I have to be cautious with it. But at the end of the day, Harmony, uh, especially um, in that regard, is a, a bit more manageable than Karma. You don't have to worry about keeping it too high, or not keeping it too high, sorry. 
more importantly with harmony you can also harmonize with religions when you do it makes you treat it as if they were your primary religion so that basically means that you can kind of one face without really one facing as long as you harmonize with everyone and when you do you pick up some buffs that's an extra buff to pick up most of them tend to be not too substantial the ones that i would recommend is mahayana for minus 10 percent idea cost that is a great one to grab early if you're going for it shinto is a nice one to pick up in terms of military point of view because there's not a lot of military buffs inside of this religion pretty much that's the only one there and that does require you going to japan and that 10 percent infantry combat ability i mean it's not great but it's something and i think it's important mentioning the other couple that i would suggest is either the trade efficiency from the muslim group and if you're able to grab that the zoroastrian 10 percent is produced is excellent to have unfortunately with all that said and done my issue is is that this religion kind of kicks you when you're down especially with the harmony modifiers um being negative but at the end of the day the buffs are pretty substantial it's quite nice in single player for the early corruption reduction and even in multiplayer at least it contains dev costs which not a lot of religions can claim so even though it's not great for combat fighting you'll be able to scale quite a bit nicer when you have 100 harmony so i think for me confusion just barely scrapes to beat here maybe it's a high seat here as well we'll see how the tier list goes on maybe i'll end up moving it eventually but for me confusion is just better getting into that b tier you need to be careful when using it you need you want to not drop to zero harmony and you want to be harmonizing with other people but it's not that hard to do and you're not exactly going out of your way to do it unlike our chiringa or you're probably going out of your way to get tasmania so now we move on to coptic oh coptic so the really, really old uh, enjoyers of the game will remember the part where Coptic was very briefly the best religion of the game. This was because no other religion had mechanics, and Coptic was one of the first to get mechanics. There is, however, a problem with this. Because Coptic was one of the first to get mechanics, it didn't really get good ones compared to the other religions for the fear of power creep. That meant that Coptic kind of really lagged behind the other groups um, now that have got new mechanics, especially when you start comparing to the other top tier religions. Catholics, which got a recent rework, are just objectively better in, compared to Coptics in almost every single step. But what do the Coptics have going for them? They start with a plus one tolerance to true faith, like most other people, and have a buff to fort defense, which, I mean, has to be mentioned here. I'm actually starting to really grow on fort defense. In multiplayer, it's nice because you're able to, well, hold off your forts longer and have more time to come back when the enemy is sieging you. And in single player, it can be useful because forts help you have more time to deal with rebels, as well as giving you more time when the AI starts to randomly carpet siege your country, because they realize they can't fight your army, so they walk around it and start being annoying and getting rid of your prosperity. So for that reason, I actually tend to find myself valuing Fort Defense more and more, as it gives you more options in that regard. However, I have to be honest, 50% Fort Defense isn't that great. It's not going to be redefining your campaign. Now, with Coptic, you have access to at least some of the Christian mechanics. You can get your PUs, so I think that's really what's keeping it at least afloat and not a complete D tier. But the other thing I have to mention is, well, it's certainly got some new great projects. The issue is, the few great projects it does have, I think are not enough to justify being Coptic. Those great projects, while nice, aren't exactly anything amazing, or nothing like the Sunni or the Catholic groups have access to. So I think it's not enough to push it out. And the aspects that you can pick up as Coptic are quite sad. Namely, you can pick up a 0 point Republic Tradition or 0 0.5 Yeti Devotion. But most things that give you that buff tend to give you either plus 1 and 0 0.3, so this legitimized government thing is quite sad. You're able to get 10% manpower recovery, which is quite a sad military buff. And you are able to get minus 10 core creation cost, which is at least not awful. I have to concede that. That's useful. The main thing is that I would say, if you are going for a Coptic one faith or any other Coptic kind of build, that you should take an eye out is at least a 1.5 missionary strength. It's not as great as 2, but at least it's greater than 1. And hey, it's 1.5 missionary strength is at least usable for your one faith builds. The 2.5 discipline for me, I just find disappointing in there. It's you, it would just be a, not even that much of a bump up if it was five. It just again just goes to show how outdated this religion is. But you still have access to the Christian mechanics. You still have access to the personal unions, so it's not as awful. And unlike other religions, Coptic doesn't tend to be actively hurting you. So I think for that reason, I'm going to be putting Coptic into C tier. It just barely gets out of D tier, but it can't really justify its existence anywhere higher than that, in my opinion. After Coptic, we move on to Fetishist. Now, Fetishist, again, is one of the Pagans, so you do have access to the Pagan, well, Wonders, which aren't great, but it's there. The main thing with Fetishist, compared to Animist, is that you do have access to the Cults, and that's where the interesting stuff begins. So your base debuffs, sorry, buffs, are going to be Torrents of Heathens and Diplomatic Reputation. That's all fun and games, that's all fine, 
Nothing too great there, but nothing too bad either. A dip rep, I mean, isn't great, but it's not hurting you. And Torrance of Heathens at least means that if you are going for a humanist, accepting everyone build, that helps. The cults is where the interesting things begin. The Buddhist cult that you unlock by interacting with Eastern religions is minus 10 dev cost. But that one I like. The issue is by the time you get there, you are probably quite a bit later into the game where you have more monarch points to spare. So having the monarch points to your institution are less critical. So it's kind of a bit less disappointing, but it has to be present there, so I have to mention it. The Christian cult is the most disappointing. Domestic trade power is a cosmetic modifier, and I will die on this hill. Followed by the other default ones that you do have access to. The best one I would recommend out of the, the default ones, if you are in, for example, Madagascar, is going to be the, the minus two national unrest if you're going conquering everywhere else. That's quite nice to have. Or the 15% manpower recovery speed. That's going to help you well recover your manpower. It's not a trivial buff, um... As for certain, but it's not going to give you the quality that you really need to fight everywhere else. And that's the other issue. There's, You do get military buffs, they're just not great. For example, you can get 2.5 discipline again. It's not something you're going to turn down, but it's not good. And if you go all the way to South America and find the Nahuatl or the Mayan religions, you can get 5 morale of armies. Again, just all around disappointing. The ones I would recommend if you actually end up doing this is if you can get the Zoroastrian 1 plus 2 merchants. is honestly quite nice to get from a religion. Normally you get plus one merchants if you get any, so plus two is quite nice to have. Also, if you are doing a vassal build, you get plus one dip rep in your base religion, and you get able to get another plus one dip rep from your cult, so you're able to get plus two dip rep from your religion, which is quite nice. Otherwise, there's some land attrition, naval maintenance modifiers, and even a goods produced cult, but they all require quite a bit of work to get your religion to be mediocre. And I think that's kind of my summary with fetishist. You have to really work to make your, this religion mediocre. So for that reason, I'm going to be putting it above Coptic, but for me, Fetish just really can't get out of C tier. Next, we move on to Hindu. Hindu, in a weird case, is a bit like Fetishist, just better. And it's going to seem a bit weird now that I'm phrasing it in such a way. Because Hindu, in essence, starts with most of the ones you actually want to use in terms of your cults, sorry, deities, unlocked. Um, this means that... You don't need to work for it, like in the ways fetishes. You don't need to go ahead and meet these other people to unlock the cults. You can use them straight away. And this means that you also have early access to them right away, which is quite a bit better. Especially when you start looking at some of their cults giving you minus 10% construction costs and minus 0.25 interest per annum. Great for building up your country and even taking loans to build. If you're also going for pure missionary strength, Vishnu is great for giving you plus 2 missionary strength, which automatically makes Coptic obsolete if you're going for pure missionary strength stacking, for example. Furthermore, for single player, you can also enjoy 10% core creation costs combined with minus 5 aggressive expansion. A wonderful combination that will both decrease your aggressive expansion as well as give you some CCR, although I have to admit both of those modifiers are quite sad on their own. But I think it's the flexibility this provides you. You have tons of the true faith as well as heathens in your base religion, so you have a bit less unrest reduction there. And you have access to both CCR if you need it, discipline and siege ability if you need it for fighting, missionary if you need it for converting, trade efficiency and tax if you need money, and dip prep and improve relations if you're trying to keep your vassals loyal, or get out of a coalition and ma manage your vassals. In general, there's very little to complain. The only locked, as it were, um, the only locked deity you have as the as the Hindu is going to be the Buddha. For that, you're going to need to do the missions, and those missions tend to be locked behind, like, three countries. So, in essence, I like to think of it as more of a country buff instead of a religion mechanic. The thing is, though, it still has to be mentioned... But the nice thing with Buddha is that compared to the other deities, he's actually not that great in my opinion. Plus the Trance of Heathens is whatever. But you get minus 10 advisor cost, which is nice, but I'm not going to be ranking the religion higher because of minus 10 advisor cost compared to other things like 5 discipline or national tax and trade efficiency or even missionary strength and construction cost. But for me, Hinduism sits firmly in B tier and I think that's where I'm going to be putting it here today. After Hinduism, we move on to Hussite. Now, Hussite is one of the few times Paradox listened to their community before the religion came out. And I think this is going to be a weird one where I'm going to say it. Be careful what you wish for. So when Hussite was initially being introduced, one of the things that people talked about is that you can do Hussite into Prussia. And I think people seeing Prussia, ooh, big scary military quantity, really got scared of some of the buffs they were given Hussite. Because initially, they were giving them some pretty impressive military buffs. I believe like 15 or was it 10 shock damage received and even some infantry combat ability inside their aspects and so on. So a lot of people on the forum certainly complain about how this would be overpowered. Will this have been overpowered? Most probably. However, this does mean that it didn't end up going to the base game, in this case Paradox listened, or they themselves wanted to change it. Whatever happened there, I don't know, I don't work at Paradox, I can't tell you. But what that has meant is that now with the Hasid that has arrived, it has arrived here in a very nerfed state. 
Regardless of that, it's still a re relatively reasonable religion, with some pretty unique stuff going for it. So, you have minus 5 shock damage received, which is an inherently not trivial military buff. It's not good, I'll be honest, minus 5 shock damage received isn't getting me excited for anything. It's only good if you're stacking shock damage received, and the same with the Archeringa's minus 5, I believe it's a fire shock damage received. Either way, it's not great, but it's at least something that's there. You also get some mission strength versus heretics which is situationally good for Bohemia specifically, or area, people in that area that are going Hussite, because you have a lot of heretics around you to convert. The issue is, is that we're talking the general religion and not anything specific here, so we're going to be having to ignore that for now, in terms of how useful it is. Overall, once you're out of your local bubble, I prefer missionary strength in general, or missionary strength versus heathens, as there's more heathens than heretics as a general rule. In terms of your aspects, you have to be aware that you can run three at the same time, unlike cults which only run one which is something to bear in mind. And you have some quite nice options here. Now, they aren't inherently strong, but they're very unique and are good for if you're trying to do something specific. The first thing I have to bring attention to is war score cost versus other religions. Now, that's a relatively rare modifier, and being able to get 10% of it is quite nice, especially a single-player concept. In multiplayer, it can be nice for punishing other countries, but to punish other countries for when you win a war against them, to be able to take more land, you need to be able to win that war against them. And Hasse doesn't really help you much with that. The only real direct armor military buff you can pick up is National Manpower Modifier, and very indirectly, you can pick up a Yeti Armor Tradition Decay. Again, both quite nice for military purposes, but non direct military buffs like something like Plus 5 Discipline you can pick up if you're Hindu and you're about to go into a war. The other thing, however, that does certainly make a standout for single player is you have access to pacifism for the greatest improved relations 30% from a religion, but it does give you a stab to declare war. This, however, can be somewhat mitigated as you can just take the aspect, have the improved relations, improve relations, and get rid of pacifism for when you're declaring the wars, so it becomes somewhat mitigated. You can also have some access to 0.05 Yeti Corruption, not as good as 0.5 from, confu uh, from Confusion, but it's still there, and you can also pick up some harsh treatment costs, which can be quite nice if you're trying to get Absolutism, and you're trying to stack harsh treatment costs to make that quite easy to just harsh treatment everyone to get your early Absolutism mechanics going. Otherwise, it's very weird in that regard. A lot of the buffs you get from it are quite sad. I mean, I'm not getting too excited for plus one torrents of heretics and ten religious unity, but it's still there, and at the end of the day, with Hussite, you still have access to a lot of the previous Catholic things, your Catholic decisions, your Catholic events, your Catholic monuments, sorry, your Christian monuments, and all the other things associated with being a Christian tag, like personal unions. And I think the Catholic mechanics that Hussite is a part of because it's a Catholic religion are really what's kind of holding Hussite in terms of viability. Because if Hussite was part of the pagan group, for example, that would really make it drop down. But I think the Catholic mechanics, plus the fact they have some unique features, for me, also will hold Hussite in beta. Next, we move on to our first Muslim, and that's going to be Ibadi. Now, Ibadi is part of the default, um, well, it's part of the, the big three Muslims. Uh, the other ones being Sunni and Shia, and we'll cover them later. The thing is with Ibadi, I believe, is that Ibadi is probably the best one out of the three. So all three Muslims have access to the Muslim religion mechanics. What I mean by that is that you have access to all the decisions, the piety mechanics, all of the formables and missions associated with being Sunni, which are quite strong, and I believe the greatest distribution of, of great projects in the world. If you're going for pure great project stacking, Muslim is the best. Specifically, Shia is the best because there are a bunch of monuments that require you being Muslim and a bunch of monuments that require you being Shia. So Shia kind of fits both of those categories, while someone like Sunni will only be able to get the Muslim ones without being able to get the Shia ones. So if you're going for pure maximum monuments, you're best off actually being Shia. Now, Ibadi, you don't get those extra monuments, but you do make up for it. Unlike Shia that gets 10 morale of armies as their mini unique buff, you get 10 goods produced. Technically worse for fighting a player war, but I find that 5 morale of armies is quite small compared to another Tengus Produce. Tengus Produce can be really impactful for your economy, and I think that on its own, plus the combination of all the other Sunni mechanics, Sunni decisions, and sorry, Muslim decisions, not Sunni decisions that you have access to, for me, are going to hold Ibadi in A tier, and I think that's probably not going to be a too controversial opinion. It's a good Produce religion that has access to the uh, piety mechanics and all the other things going with Muslim. It's a great religion all around. Right, well after Abadi, we're going to be moving on to Inti. Now, again, Inti is one of our pagan options, so Inti is one of the um, religions you... Well, it's not one of, it is the religion that you're getting for the most part if you're playing as the Inca, and that's about it. So Inti, if you don't have the DLC, is going to be incredibly disappointing. It's going to give you two turns of the True Faith and 0.05 monthly autonomy change. That's it. If you are, however, at least playing with the DLCs, you'll have access to so the reforms, 
those are the things you need to get to just be able to actually play the game and get your government forms and all the other things. But they are going to give you opponent buffs at the end of the game, so it's at least something to consider. And what's nice is that you get all five of them, so it's not like you have to pick and choose which ones you're running, unlike the other mechanics. So, removing the fact that you're playing as a Native American from this debate, and looking at it purely, you get three monuments as well, three unique monuments, as well as the Pagan group, so that's nice. You do pick up two tones of the True Faith and some monthly autonomy change, which isn't awful, but it's not something to complain all about. Let's take a look at these three forms, because they're going to be the things that break and make or break this religion. And it's starting off pretty reasonably. For your multiplayer focused people and just for army quality, we have 10 morale of armies and 10 manpower recovery speed. They're both not great. I mean, 10 manpower recovery speed could be better, but it's still there and I'm not going to sniff at it. 10 morale of armies is nice. There's just no way of putting it. 10 morale of armies is nice. It's not as good as 15 morale of armies. That would be defining a religion. But 10 morale of armies is going to be suddenly getting you up there and it's a non-trivial military buff. It's certainly a lot better than 5 morale of armies. You're then able to pick up your legitimacy on Yeti Devotion, which is quite nice. The thing is, with that mechanic, is bear in mind it was coded a while back, so it does not give you Republican tradition if you decide to flip Republic, and it also doesn't give you Horde Unity if you decide to go forward for whatever reason. Now, the big one that I think also makes it really stand out for single player, and in multiplayer as well, isn't trivial, is you get the core creation cost, which means that you spend less out in coring. Excellent in single player and useful in multiplayer, and you pick up a colonist, which is just nice. Even when you're not too focused on colonizing, an extra colonist is nice because it can at least basically dev for you for free. And if you are colonizing, it's excellent. It's pretty much one of the strongest colonial buffs you can give to a country because it's quite easy to stack other colonial buffs, like your global settlers. Very hard to stack colonists. Very few things give you a colonist. So that reform for plus one colonist, I think, really is what's holding Inti up there. My issue is, is that compared to a lot of the other religions, um, it just doesn't get up there. And while 10 morale of armies and 10 manpower speed is great, for me, all that does is uh, the colonist is make it at least situationally useful. You have to work for these reforms, it's not something you get out for free, like Hinduism. And in general, my issue with this religion overall is that inherently having this religion forces you to start the game later than everyone else because you don't have access to your default reforms, so you're going to be going to your reforms later, which means you have less time to reform progress, to gain govcap and all the other things as well associated with that. So because of that, because there's some inherent debuffs that come from just existing as Inti, I'm going to be putting it into C2. After that, we move on to Jewish. Now, Jewish is an interesting religion in that it's technically not even a Christian and Muslim domination, which is fair, but that means it doesn't have access to Christian unique mechanics, like personal unions. It doesn't have access to Muslim unique mechanics, and it just kind of sits there in a weird position, being an Abrahamic faith without a lot of the Abrahamic mechanics, which I think is an important thing to mention. In the same way that you also have Zoroastrian, which is, I mean, if arguing whether Zoroastrian is an Abrahamic faith, it's not, is a whole religious debate and there's a lot more better educated scholars than me that can weigh on this but again going back to jewish it's going to be fitting outside of those groups as far as the game is concerned which means it's not going to have access to a lot of the mechanics we associate with the abrahamic religions like the sunni monuments and sunni decisions and piety mechanics and the christian personal unions and pope and all the other christian associated mechanics as well jewish however makes up for it by just being very good and this is where the thing with judaism a lot of the buffs from it are just nice all around. So, with Judaism, you get two transfer true faith and a possible advice. That's quite nice. It's one of the higher tolerances you can get in the game. But the thing that makes it nice is you get access to th Torah aspects that you can choose to focus on. And the best way of summarizing is they're all just nice. For the Abin ones, you get to choose between minus two unrest, minus five tech costs, and minus 0 0.5 interest per annum. All three of those are excellent. Tech cost is just nice to get if you are catching up on technology. Interest per annum is great if you're catching up on money and have to take debt. And minus two unrest is great when you're blobbing and you're trying to mitigate rebels. You're also able to celebrate festivals at the cost of the equivalent church power for the Jewish mechanics. And those festivals are just nice. You're able to gain money from the interest per annum one to help pay off your debt. You're able to get government reform progress growth or legi and legitimacy. If you've got the tech one, which again helps you catch up if you're behind on that. And reform progress growth, I'd never, you know, turn my nose up to because that's govcap. And the minus two unrest one gives you stability. So again, it's great in that context of single player where you're really hard blobbing. So you probably want to pick up that stability. Again, it's the road gives you access to stability, which is great. The diplomatic ones are also quite nice. You can pick up two transfer the true faith. And in the weirdest way, the diplomatic one for bus transfer the true faith is excellent if you're blobbing. Because it gives you the unique mechanic where no owned Jewish provinces will suffer the penalties of non-accepted culture. And the same culture group. So what that means is that if you've converted a province to Jewish, it's going to then become basically accepted culture, which is quite strong. 
It, the only other religion that, the only other game, uh, country that has this mechanic is the Mughal Divan, which basically culturally simulates everyone once you've conquered them. And this kind of gives you that, but without the buffs. It m lets you mitigate a lot of the debuffs from non-accepted cultures, and hence that's just really nice when you're blobbing. And hence Jewish community plus um, the minus unrest one is what I would recommend if you're doing for a Jewish world conquest. You gain uh, quite a lot of unrest stack here. Plus four tolerance to the true face, as well as plus two unrest flat, as well as access to the ability. It's quite strong. But if you don't want to go for the tolerance to the true faith, you're also able to pick up tolerance of heathens, which when you celebrate the festival is going to give you 20% goods produced and 20% tax on the province, which is quite nice. Well, every other province that's not your religion, which is mostly just going to be counteracting the wrong religion malice, but it's still quite nice to have. And you're also getting access to minus 10 dev cost if that's something you need. What's great with that dev cost is it's optional. So for a single player, it's when you're devving your institution you can go into it. And in multiplayer, when you need to do your dev cycle, you can just go into it and then run something else later. So in general, it's just really nice. And the military aspects are even more amazing. The first one is a bit deceptive because it seems very weak, minus 5 infantry cost, but its bonus is where it becomes insane. Because while at war, you're going to receive 20% manpower recovery speed and 25% faith power, which doubles if you're in defensive war. So if you're ever decked as a Jewish nation, you're able to get 40% manpower recovery. And that's really strong, and I think that's kind of makes up for the lack of specific military buffs you actually get in this religion. And that's one of its weaknesses, you get very few actual military buffs. Then you can get 25% fort defense if you really want to be, you know, roaching with forts, but I think it's weaker than 40% map recovery. Finally, however, if you are just there desperately for trying to look for military buffs, you do get access to five morale of armies and navies. That's weak, and I'm not a fan of it. It does give you a weird mechanic where every time you win a battle, you reduce your war exhaustion by 0.05. But if you want to have a war exhaustion reduction tick, just play Ireland. It has 0.05% war, war exhaustion in their missions, and the, uh, sorry, in their ideas, and you're just going to get that every month instead of having to win a battle every time for it. So that's quite a nice thing to have. With that all being said and done, however, Judaism really stands out as well because it still has access to a decent amount of great projects. And more importantly, if you do retake the Holy Land, you get access to the triggered modifier of owning that again, which is going to give you even more military buffs to make up for the lack of military buffs. So there's a lot of potential for this religion and has a lot of excellent buffs to pick up. So that reason alone, Judaism for me makes it into AT. And then we move on to Mahayana. Now, Mahayana is the first of our Eastern religion within the Buddhist denominations. Before I played EU4, I did not realize there were so many Buddhists, is what I'm going to tell you. In fact, there's three. Now, all three Buddhists function similarly in terms of the mechanics available to them. Um, that's Yamayana, Theravdara, and Vairyana. But what, where they differ is basically their national buff. They all have access to the karma mechanic, which I'm not too much of a fan of, because it kind of it can end up punishing you if you go too high in the karma or too low in the karma. So something you have to constantly bear in mind and micromanage to be able to fully utilize. But at least when you utilize it, it's a decent, decent buff. When you have your neutral karma, so when you are micro in your country to utilize it, you're able to get plus two day prep and plus five discipline, which is quite nice to have. Plus five discipline is something you should definitely not scoff at in your religion. My issue is, if you want plus five discipline from the religion, just play Hindu and you just run the god for it. And when you don't need five discipline, let's say for when you're blobbing, you can just turn that off. In terms of karma, you can't just disable karma for your country, unfortunately. However, unlike Confucian, at least there's no debuffs to having low karma. Now, with Mahayana specifically, you get idea costs, which I value quite nicely because it lets you fill out your idea groups early, but it's only 5%, so it's not great. And for me, with Mahayana, it's just kind of a sad religion. The great projects you have access to are quite bad. I mean, there's still some. I think bad is the wrong word. There's just not many of them you have access to. So it's not awful in the area. My issue is, is that there's just a lot of better religions in the area. A lot of religions in the area compared to it that just do everything better. So even from a situational point of view, there are better things to flip to. But on the grand scheme of things, though, minus five idea cost, two trials of heretics, and a potential five discipline is a very sad list of buffs to be looking at. It's not as awful as Animist, but it's not even getting into C tier by my definitions. So, as weird as it sounds, putting a religion that's reformed above something like Inti, at least Inti has a much better late, late game than Mahayana. So, Mahayana, I'm afraid, is going to be going into D tier. It's probably one of the better Buddhists with minus five idea cost. But I'm just not a fan of it overall in terms of how much you can get out of that religion. It's not a lot. On that note, though, we are going to be moving on to Mayan, not Nawatl. I'm not sure why the order there was messed up. But anyway, Mayan now. So, Mayan is an interesting one. So, pretty much in practice, never seen unless you're playing in the Mayan religions. Which, I guess, makes, makes sense. Mayan, as well, is one of the religions that, for the most part, 
is a reform religion, like Inti and the other ones, so you need to go through your reforms. And let's talk about them now. So you get a plus, plus one to answer the true faith, which is decent, you take it, and a possible advisor, which is great. The other issue is, though, that's kind of it. You also have the same drawbacks as Inti, in terms of you, you, if you are mine, you have to go through all the reforms before you can do things. But if you do go through reforms, you pick up minus 10 land maintenance modifier, which is actually not that bad. It can t save you a lot of money on your army, and your army tends to be quite a big deal in both single player and multiplayer as one of your big expenses. You're able to pick up minus 2 unrest, which I value quite a bit, especially compared to plus 2 to the true faith, as that minus 2 unrest applies everywhere, especially in newly conquered provinces, which can be quite valuable. You pick up 10 infantry combat ability, which is quite a nice military buff. It's not as good as some of the other ones, but it's not something that should be scoffed at as well. And you still have access to the same plus 1 colonists that Inti has. Where, however, Mayan does differ for me is the 20% core creation cost. That is a lot more substantial than 10, and now we're starting to look at some potential core creation cost reduction stacking. And core creation cost in single player is a wonderful thing to stack. So there's still a decent chunk of potential here with mine. It's just really held back by the fact that if you are mine, you're starting with reformed. There's very few great projects for you to have access to and a lot of other late game potential issues. You can basically reform into a reasonable religion, but you have to really work for it. And I think that's pretty much the hallmark of a C religion. Yes, you don't start that strong, but at least you become reasonable through a lot of work. And I think that's why it belongs firmly into C tier. Now we move on to Nahuatl. Now, Nahuatl is the Mexico Aztec religion, and it may be weirdly inflated because if you are playing a native anywhere, Mexico is probably the one where you end up actually playing. Now, with that being said, though, you have to bear in mind you have access to the Doom mechanic, and given that this is, as far as debuffs from your religion go, Doom is probably one of the worst ones, as you, if you know, if you go to 100, very bad things happen. So, the fact that you can actively get punished by having this religion is something that's going to make me hold it back, although I understand from a playing the game point of view, that's just a role play mechanic. It's just very important to manage your Doom if you are playing Nawatl. However, with that being said, Nawatl has a lot of other things going for it. You immediately start with 10 morale of armies and minus 2 unrest. Minus 2 unrest in your religion is a lot better than plus 2 to the true faith, because that's basically minus 2 unrest everywhere, so that's great. And also, if you happen to have the Burgers estate, they are less influential, which I guess it makes sense, but also doesn't, I don't know. It's there. That's a thing. Regardless, Samurai of Armies is a great one to just have right off the bat, especially since there's something you're getting early game when morale matters. It's something you have to pick up, it's just there. Although I have to, I have to admit, it's not the greatest military buff to get. And minus two unrest is, not, is certainly something that's not bad. Now, you have access to your reforms, and this is where it definitely becomes interesting. Because Noato really, when you do get all the reforms going for you, starts to shine in a multiplayer context because not only do you have 10 morale you'll also be able to pick up five discipline for you until the end of the game and running both morale and discipline from your religion is quite nice you'll also be able to get the same 0.05 monthly war exhaustion which is quite good for death war in your multiplayer context but i have to admit an extra five discipline and monthly war exhaustion isn't great in single player for single player you pick up an extra corners and dip relations and unlike inti and mayan where you don't have access where you have corporation costs you don't you get stab cost modifier instead which i think is a lot worse but you still have your colonist, you still have discipline, you still have your monthly war exhaustion, and I think its potential in multiplayer is what is going to be holding up for the fact that you skip out on corporation cost. You still have the same colonist there. For me, I think Nomad is probably the best out of the Native American religions. It's going to be going to the top of that, but I'm not going to be putting it above Coptic, I'm afraid. After that, we move on to Norse. Norse is an interesting one. It used to be a converter religion from Crusader Kings 2. Uh, however, it did get added as pretty much an Easter egg. Now, I did mention that we're not going to be judging a religion based on how hard it is to get it. If we were, however, Norse would be the bottom of D tier, because Dear Lord Alive is made as well be an Easter egg religion with how hard it is to actually pick up this religion. Norse is incredibly painful to ever get, ever really. Um, I mean, there's no better way of putting it. It's just a pain. You have to go through unique event chains as Norway and all those things. But anyway, I digress. If you are looking at Norse in isolation, how good is it as a religion? Well, it's pagan, so you get access to the pagan group of great projects, which is mediocre at best, to be honest. But hey, it's still something compared to some of the other uh, some of the other monument distributions. So it's there. You get land force limit, naval force limit. I mean, ten land force limit isn't bad. I'm not going to scoff at it if I had the option to get ten percent land force limit. It's just that's not the greatest military buff you get access to. And then you can pick up your deities. Now, the deities are interesting, again, much like the piety cards, you can only run one compared to something like Hussai, which can run multiple, but they're a bit more substantial. The big ones you'll be looking at usually, I find, is going to be the 5 discipline and 10 national sailors. It's a weird one, 
you're getting 10 land force and a 5 discipline from erosion, which isn't bad, but it's not great either. The other one that's good for economically is 10 goods produced and 10 trade efficiency. And in single player, I find the 10% core creation cost useful. It's just it also comes with 0.1 yellow legitimacy. And I already don't value one yellow legitimacy well. So 0.5 I find is a very minimal buff. 0.1 is a drop in the bucket. It's a very sad, pathetic increase in legitimacy. I mean, it's going to take you 100 years, 100 years of gameplay to recover 10 legitimacy. Something you can lose from an event. Like that is very irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. But it is what it is. For scaling, you also have access to my same construction cost, so it's not great. My issue with um, Norse overall is that it's just weak on everything. It's got 5 discipline, so it's very hard to be super harsh towards it. The issue is, is that outside of that 5 discipline and 10% land force limit, you're going for what? 10% core creation cost, some construction cost, even 10 goods produced. Like, it's, it's very all over the place, very unconcentrated for the buffs you're actually getting, and there's nothing to stand out about it. It's not a bad religion, it's just really not good. At least you don't have to work for a lot of these buffs, but unlike something like Hindu again, which I keep comparing to, the buffs that you do get are, well, I don't think they're worth it compared to the the other things you can get there. Now, that that's more of just not marking Norse up there. At the end of the day, 5 discipline is great, 10% core creation costs, something you can't complain about, 10% construction costs helps your early scaling, and because produced modified trade efficiency is all great for economy. So for me, I think it's still a very reasonable religion to go to. It's just, uh, I think there's so much more potential in this religion, given how hard it is to get it in practice. So for me, it's almost a disappointment for how weak it is, given how much effort it is. But again, on this tier list, we're not marking how much effort it is. And for me, Norse, if you're just making a custom nation for it, I think sits honestly just above Hindu, because technically his buffs on its own are just that little bit better than Hindu. You could get access to Tengus produce, not five, and there's a little bit of small things like that that are just slightly an improvement over Hindu. Is just given how painful this religion actually is to get. Again, if we were con considering that as a factor, it's bottom of DTA. It's just not worth going through the pain to actually get this religion in practice. But again, if we're not taking that into account, I think it sits solidly up there in B tier. Nothing to complain about there with Norse. Now we move on to Orthodox, a country that I've had pretty much no one ever really complain about. Because Orthodox is, if you ever played multiplayer, the go-to country in terms of what you want to get out of your religion. So, Orthodox has access to all the Christian mechanics, your personal unions, your decisions, a bunch of monuments, excellent religion all around. Even a couple of unique um, Orthodox monuments like the uh, St. Basil's Cathedral and the Kiev Persia Lavra. Just all of these wonderful monuments, you have all access to all those things as well. Great, no, no complaints there. You get to stab cost of transfer to true faith, it's your default power, but your default, but that's not where your um where your religion shines, as it were. So first things first, you get access to patriarch authority. Patriarch authority is unlike other scalers, where at zero you get bad things, at zero you get nothing. And when you scale it to 100, it becomes really nice. You get extra missionary strength, which is excellent single player for converting your land. You get clerical influence, which is actually I find quite useful because in the early game, clerical influence gives you more tax. And later on, I find estates when you revoked all of them to get absolutism. You tend to struggle to have that influence up at a substantial level, where if you want to get buffs from your estates, you need that influence to be reasonable. And it's kind of hard to keep your clergy influential, I find, in the late game. So that's almost even a buff to it, but I can understand you treat it as not really a buff. However, it's an excellent religion to one face because when you do and you have 100% um, Patriarch Authority, you get minus 3 unrest in those provinces, in essence giving you an extra, you know, plus 3 taunts to the true faith, just on every single province when you have that, um, when you have the Patriarch Authority, and 33% local manpower modifier, and that 33% manpower is amazing. This is one of the reasons that that religion, honestly, on its own is quite top tier, that's quite a lot of manpower you're getting as a base level from your religion. And this is made even greater by the fact that you have access to some of the best quote-unquote icons that you can pick up in the game, especially compared to the other things. Are you going into a single player context where you're really blobbing and you need a lot of unrest reduction as well as maybe getting some absolutism? Icon of Elusia. Minus 3 unrest and 25% harsh treatment cost is amazing. You have minus 3 unrest, one of the greater reductions there. If you're stacking that with a true tolerance build, you're already looking at pretty much minus 7 unrest on every province. Plus 1 true faith, plus 3 from the Patriarch Authority, minus 3 from the Icon. And the harsh treatment cost, this lets you get your absolutism quite a bit easier if you want to be taking that route. Unlike the harsh treatment cost that you get in Hussite, 
This one isn't on its own. It comes with minus gen rest, so it's quite a bit more nicer. You have your early scaling with construction cost and 10 dev cost at the same time. You have access to another 5 display and 10% manpower recovery speed with the icon of St. Michael. And that manpower recovery speed works excellent in, in combination with 33% local manpower. You just get so much more manpower as you're able to get more manpower base and more manpower recovery. And again, if you are going for single player and you're worried about aggressive expansion, you get a wonderful combination of dealing with that. St. Nicholas, minus 10 AE impact. Again, quite a substantial amount of AE impact and 25% improved relations to help you improve out of all of your coalitions. On top of that, again, all of these don't have any drawbacks to ever taking them. It's quite a bit easier to stack Patriarch Authority to get it pretty much constantly at 100. You can concentrate Metropolitans if you really want to get rid of your monthly devastations and get Patriarch Authority up quickly. Again, just nothing to complain about. Consecrating gives you plus 10 state maintenance, which is pretty relevant in the grand scheme of things, and gives you some devastation decreases in the short run, uh, sorry, in the long run as well. Just honestly, a really incredible religion, and I'm surprised I didn't get nerfed when it got released. Right now, it, there's other religions that caught up to it in terms of its value, you know, playability. But again, the fact that it's also a Catholic, so you have access to the same PU mechanics, you have access to all the Christian decisions and all the other mechanics. I mean, it would be a crime if I put Orthodox in anything on the top of S tier for the time being, and honestly, for the foreseeable future as well. Orthodox really is basically the religion you want to be at. Right, with me praising Orthodox enough, time to move on to the next one, Protestantism. Now, Protestantism used to be quite good when the we had the old um, mechanics for Catholics um, as an option reform, and it's still not exactly bad now. When you do flip into Protestant from Catholics, you gain some tax, which is whatever. You get improved relations, which is unironically quite useful, and it's built in on like the Hussite one, so it's just there constantly to help you deal with coalitions. And your clergy is a bit more loyal. But at the end of the day, my issue with Protestant is quite how weak now their um, church aspects became. In the same way that Coptic suffered from getting early mechanics now, Protestantism suffers from the church aspects they get now being quite weak. There was a rework somewhat recently where they got some extra ones and some temporary effects when they were assigned. But in the grand scheme of things, I find that really struggle now. So first of all, for example, um, you get five morale of armies and navies, which is quite sad compared to other religions that are normally giving you 10 if that's something that's a morale origin. You can get 0 0.5 unit prestige, which, I mean, whatever. You get things like minus 5 idea cost. In in concept, idea cost is great, but minus 5 is quite a sad amount of it. And minus 1 unrest from a religion is quite sad when you have things like Orthodox running out with minus 3. You can also get minus 5 aggressive expansion, but again, you have things like Orthodox running out with minus, you know, minus 10. So it's just not great at the things it does. You do also get minus 5 missionary strength and minus 5 dev cost, but again, it's just sadness all around. And the assignment buffs, which is what you do when you pick them, aren't awful on their own, but I don't think they make up for the fact that you have to reassign them. The ones that I found weirdly useful is war ceremonies for minus 100% war taxes cost, because actually running free war taxes is quite powerful. The issue is, is um, it expires in 10 years, so that's another thing for you to bear in mind mentally. Oh, I'm running war taxes. I need to get rid of them when they become later. So while it's a strong buff, it's another thing for you to mentally keep a track of. Now... Protestantism is still strong, you still have access to the usual Christian mechanics, or your PUs and all of those things, but it's just really not as good as a lot of the other Christians as well that you can now get, and it really suffers from the Coptic problem of being one of the earlier religions to get buffs, and therefore compared to the you know power creep that we've seen in the game, it's starting to really like behind now. However, because it's still a Christian domination, I'm going to really struggle putting Protestantism in anything but BT. I think it's just not nowhere near to C tier now, but it's not as good as the A and S tiers. With that being said, we move on to Reformed. Now, Reformed is the weird cousin of Protestant. Um, it didn't get that many religions now, but in a weird way, it has been buffed and nerfed. So before running the fervor aspects used to cost you five fervor a month. Now it costs eight, but they have suddenly been buffed. I believe that kind of happened because with a lot of modified stacking, you used to be able to actually stack quite a bit of fervor growth. So you started being able to run quite a lot of them at the same time. So my OCD would never be happy, as it's pretty much impossible to run all three at the same time now. But I have to admit, the the aspects they have now are quite a bit stronger. You can It's also reasonably easy to go for further stacking if you are actually, you know, go for it properly. Like getting it from Defender of Faith, getting it from Religious Unity, having it from the Clergy Privileges, becoming, um, getting some monuments for it. There's a decent chunk of monuments that give it to you having positive stability, and again, just basically, if you're doing well, you can get a decent chunk of fervor. For example, being at 100 prestige means you're probably doing well, and there you get an extra fervor point for it. But, 
at least compared to things like karma, you're not losing further points and having low further doesn't make your country worse, which is quite nice. As a default, you're getting a possible advice of two tons for heretics. It's whatever. A possible advice that helps you when you're cycling, so it's a minimal quality of life thing, but it's nothing to really call home about. At 100 uh, scaling further, you do get construction costs and stab costs. So the construction costs, I do tend to quite value as a scaler. And even in single pair, it's quite nice if you're getting your your um, uh, your uh, gut cap buildings and all of those things built. So that has to be valuable. And in single player, what really makes it shine is the minus five years of separatism and the 10 improved relations. Helps you just overcome a lot of those coalition and unrest issues that you'll be dealing with in single player. So for that, I have to respect it. The main thing with further, of course, is the aspects with it. Uh, there's four. Now, quite a lot of them are actually quite nice, and the thing is with these aspects is they're able to switch into which ones you need at the time. But when you're at war, getting 10 morale of armies and plus 5 morale damage is quite nice. It's just a bit better than having 15 morale of armies, because getting an extra 5 morale, da morale damage is a bit better than 5 morale. I can't quote the math right, but I believe 5 morale damage is just barely worse than 7.5 morale. So it sits in this weird limbo zone where 5 morale damage is like extra morale on average it's weird obviously they work differently it's a bit hard to compare apple store oranges etc etc but if you're forced to compare it i would say that it's just a touch better than 15 percent morale of armies and getting that from your religion is quite nice it's not as good as catholics being able to get 20 if they're getting a crusade as well as their papal blessing but it's still you know up there 15 morale of armies you can get 10 goods produced as well as trade efficiency and global trade power for trade if you need money which is excellent and you can get dev costs and unrest if you get stability nothing to complain there in single player, if you're also going for vassal builds, you can get an extra 2 dip and 25 improved relations, which is nothing to complain about there at all. And spy action cost modifier is something, although I find it's more of a mechanic that you add to fill out a list and compare something you actually use. I mean, 25% spy action cost modifier, great. Now my um, no, no, I'm gonna save five on building a, you know, building a claim. It's gonna cost me 15, not 20 to get a claim. I've saved myself what four months on a CB. It's not trivial, but I'm not going to say it's something amazing. So it's not that great on all the modifiers. It's still a very solid religion, and a lot of the buffs that you do get it from it are quite useful. However, I, in terms of reformed overall, from a personal point of view, I'm going to be putting it pretty much at the top of B tier. I don't think it makes its way into A tier. It's not quite got the consistency of all the other buffs, and you do have to work a bit to get them. And they're certainly great, but I don't think it gets into A tier. But... It, Top of BT, I think, is a good place for it. All right, with reform done, we now move on to Shia, um, not Shinto. Interesting uh, that I imported these in alphabetical order, but it seems that the tier list thing uh, messed them up for me. Or maybe I just imported them in alphabetical order badly. But anyway, Shia. So Shia is a Muslim denomination. I mentioned it earlier compared to Ibadi. It does have the same five morale of armies and has all the other reasons basically for why it's good. If you want to see the list of why it's good, then the TLDR of it is the Muslim mechanics. You have piety that you can work with, you have all the decisions, you have all the monuments to work with, and it's just an excellent religion all around. So for that reason alone, I'm going to be putting a Shia as well in A tier. However, it's going to be lower than both Jewish and Ibadi because I feel like those two mechanics, have, those religions have a bit more going for them compared to Shia. But it's still very comfortable in A tier as well. It's just an excellent religion, and five morale of armies never really hurts. On top of all the other Muslim mechanics you want. Right, that was a quick one. Now we move on to Shinto. Ooh, that's going to be an interesting one. I mean, my issue with Shinto is a lot of people's perspective on Shinto is I'm playing Japan. So I think it's important to isolate Shinto as a religion on its own from playing Japan, which I think has to be done for the purpose of making this a fair comparison. So Shinto begins with 10 morale of armies, much like Nomato, so that's already a pretty decent buff. And you get into Torrance and Heretics. Unlike Nomato, however, you if you're playing Shinto, you're not forced to go through all the reforms to actually have a playable country. With that, however, Shinto gets access to the isolationism mechanics, which are very role-playing. You get a bunch of um, events and later things that you move around, whether you want to be a isolationist country or an open country, with varying degrees of buffs you can pick up from it. So when you have open doors, you can get tech costs, trade efficiency, and dip rep, which is okay. Same can be sent for adaptive for minus five idea costs and institution spread, it's okay. Selective integration at tier two is again okay. You get construction costs, but that's pretty much it that you're getting from your religion. You can also pick up isolationism if you go to tier three for missionary and culture conversion cost. If you're going for the one faith, it's great. It's an amazing thing to go for if you're going for the one faith or the one culture. If you're not, it's very meh. 
and the final tier of closed doors. Tolerance of true faith, global prosperity, growth, and dev cost is great, but bear in mind that's pretty much all you're getting from your religion. 10 morale of armies, some dev cost, and a tolerance of true faith. It's not bad, but that's it. And I think that's kind of the summary of Shinto. A lot of the things that people associated with, oh, Shinto being good, come from the fact that Japan has a lot of things going for it to have a lot of buffs. Shinto on its own tends to quite struggle. You have a very limited amount of monuments, you have a very limited amount of buffs, and while the default buff of Hemorale of Armies isn't bad, it's not a lot to get there from Shinto on its own. So I think because a lot of people tend to conflate Shinto with the Japan buffs, and the Japan buffs are excellent, let's be clear about that, if you just look at Shinto in isolation, if you're not doing Japan as Shinto, which again is technically quite hard to do, on its own as a religion, it's quite sad. Now, I'm going to be putting it higher than things like Coptic and Fetishist, because unlike those, you don't have to work for your buffs. It's just the buffs that you do get are quite sad, in my opinion, even regardless of your level of play. Again, if you're comparing it in the context of Japan, amazing religion. If you're comparing it outside of the context of other things, really not a great one on that note. After that, however, move on to Steak. Now, Steak is a religion that got recently reworked, especially in Leviathan, and given how overpowered a lot of things in Leviathan are, you would assume that Seek made, out, made it out like a bandit from that reform. And you'd be correct. Seek made it out like an absolute bandit from that reform. It was an It's now probably one of the nicer religions to pick up. You get 10% morale of armies, much like Shinto, so that's something to complain about. But you also get 10 mil tech cost. Mil tech cost is very good because if you're behind on mil tech cost, it lets you catch up faster. And if you're not, it lets you take mil tech cost ahead of time trying to punish and timing push people. If you're able to take Miltech 15 ahead of time compared to someone who's got Miltech 14, and you're able to use that Miltech 15 against them, you're basically using plus one morale against them, and that's incredibly strong. And this is the kind of plays that Seek it, it allow. That Miltech cost is a very powerful thing to have, that minus 10%. And this is then inflated by the fact that as the Seeks, you have access to the Seek Gurus. And if you ever wanted me to um, talk about how good the um, the Monarch Points are, because, uh, sorry, the Monarch Point gain is from Alcharinga, Steak does it, but just better, because you can just take the Seek Gurus for the, for the Monarch Points one specifically, and then get any extra buffs you want in a very mini sense. You can pretty much build your own religion with Seekism, depending on which Gurus you want to use. Now, some are naturally better than others, I'll be honest. Um, comparing things like 0.5 Prestige, uh, which is... Uh, whatever, to some of the other buffs you can get here, like an extra Missionary, just straight up an extra Missionary, or minus 10 Dev Cost, or even things like um, 0.5 year on professionalism, which has to bit up your arm professionalism a lot faster, is a disingenuous comparison. But the point is, there's so many buffs you have access to here. If you want unrest, it's there. If you want reduced unity, it's there. You want an extra 5 morale of armies, it's there. You want 2.5 discipline, it's there. I mean, it's not 5 discipline, but you cannot complain. You want the monarch point skills, it's there. It's pretty much all there. The thing that's holding Seek back to me is the fact that it is kind of time-locked. Some of the later Seeks you have to wait until 1708, that's three quarters of the game that's passed already. I know I mentioned time locking not being a thing for the religion itself, but when the religion has, so unlocking it, but even if you create a custom nation in 1444 with this religion, you're not going to have access to a bunch of these gurus and mechanics right away, so from that, uh, that point of view, I do have to value the time locking from it quite a bit behind. And even though Seek is an excellent religion for both fighting militarily, the other thing I have to bear in mind is that there are better religions for single player if you are trying to do a world conquest. And for that reason, I'm going to be having to mark a Seek quite a bit harsher. So for me, Seek does not make it into S tier in, I think if it was a purely multiplayer tier list, simply the access to the morale as well as the customizability for what you actually need and all the other things would put Seek for me into S tier. But the lack of military, the lack of uh, buffs for single player kind of hold it back. Not that it's not buffed for single player, it's access to the missioning for crying out loud, as well as some trade efficiency and religious unity or whatever you may end up using from more single player, that's there. It's just, for me, there are better things that can achieve the same goals within a single player concept for me. So for that's low performance in single player is going to be dragging Seek down to A tier. It's still going to be a very strong contender at A tier. I'm going to be putting it pretty much tied with the baddie. I think probably just, just about squeezing out your baddie in the context of single player as well for how it's going to perform. But I'm not going to be putting into S tier as well. And now, this might be a controversial choice. Seek may not be that loved, but it's certainly a very strong religion, especially when you take a look at how many buffs you can get and how customizable those buffs are. Right, that's Seek. Now we move on to Sunni. Sunni is going to have a very similar story to Shia. I think it's just marginally worse than Shia, but Sunni is basically a default flavor of Muslim. And for that reason alone, I think it's pretty much just earned its way to just 
eke its way into the A tier list simply because of how good the Muslim mechanics are, not because of how good specifically Sunni is. I'll be honest, 10% cap to infantry ratio isn't bad if you take going for cap to infantry ratio, but it tends to not be used, and chance of new air is chance of new air. It's not like you're a risk of PU. So most is going to, what, save you 8 legitimacy? That's about it. Uh, because if you die without an air and you don't get PU, you get a random local noble that starts with 20 legitimacy. So you're probably not going to get that happen as a Sunni because you're going to get an air most of the time. So it's going to save you 8 legitimacy at times. But again, the other Muslims have it as well, so it's not like a unique Sunni thing. It's the pure Muslim mechanics that keep it in 8 for you. Right, after that we move on to Tengri, a very interesting choice, probably one of the better pagans. And the other thing I think it's important to mention with Tengri is that Tengri religions are Tengri countries aren't inherently unlike something like Inti, where if you are Inti you are need to go through your reforms before you're allowed to become civilized. Tengri countries do not have that limitation. They can have the institutions, get their government reforms and so on and so on while being Tengri. I think that's meant to be limited, uh, well, modeled by the fact that Tengri countries tend to be hordes or they tend to be tribal countries. I think that's meant to be the, the point there, but regardless, that does mean that you can be Tengri without the associated debuffs of being a uh, being not Tengri. With Tengri, you get 25% cap to free ratio. That's a lot more than 10% to work with, and it means they can pick up 25% from anywhere else, which you can get from just not having a secondary religion. We'll talk about that in a minute. You can get 100% cap to free ratio. So any cap builds cannot complain about being about Tengri because you just get 100% cap to free ratio for free just for existing which is excellent. With that being said and done, with, well, not quite. So Tengri gives you 25% cap to ratio, which you lose if you get a secondary religion. Hordes get an extra 25% cap to ratio, so it's not like you get a default 100% cap to ratio if you're just Tengri, to be, to be clear to. I think I communicated that bad. Anyway, with Tengri, unlike Confucian, where you can accept as many cultures as possible, you can take a secondary religion for a specific buff. You can only take one, and you do lose the 25% cap infantry ratio for the purpose of doing that. In general, I find when I am playing Tengri countries, I'm playing a horde, I tend to not really pick up a secondary religion, because I like to keep my cap infantry ratio. But if that's not an issue, you can certainly pick up one, so you don't have to worry about converting it, because it makes it treated as a true faith for the purposes of unrest and other reductions. And there's a lot of interesting options here, and not a lot of them are bad at all. Um, a lot of them can be quite sad with the buffs they give you, but they aren't exactly disappointing either. In, I mean, if you manage to grab Anglican, minus 10 idea costs, starting to be scoffed at. It just tends to be quite late when you grab it. Shia can give you morale of armies, and it's not that hard to get, although it's only 5%. And you're able to pick up 5% discipline from Shinto and other places like that. So it's certainly not a weak religion in that sense. It's just that you have to be careful with what you're going for here, uh, since you can only get one. Tengri, for me though, however, tends to be quite inflated in terms of how it performs because it's associated with hordes, and hordes are good, especially in the context of single player, and somewhat in the early game for multiplayer as well. If you look at Tengri from a, just a pure religion point of view, okay, you don't have the inter debuff of, I have to be a primitive with it. However, at the end of the day, you're getting what? A secondary religion bonus, and you're getting some cap to infantry ratio. Great if you're getting, doing cav, don't get me wrong, it's very strong if you're doing cav. And you should probably be doing cav if you're doing Tengri. But at the same time, I'm not seeing the breadth of other bonuses that other religions provide. So if you're doing a build around Tengri, it holds up. If you And if you are using Tengri for your World Conquest as a Horde, it's excellent. But I think you have to separate what bonuses you're getting from a Horde and what bonuses you're getting from Tengri. And the bonuses you're getting from Tengri are really not that amazing in the grand scheme of things, especially compared to the other religions. So for me, Tengri, because of this viability and its options to squeeze out uh, cavalry and its potential in terms of if you really build around it, I think can beat out fetishes for C tier, but I'm not going to be putting it any above that, I'm afraid. Probably a controversial choice, but bear in mind again, a lot of things probably associated that are good with Tengri are good because you're either doing a cav build or you're playing a horde. So overall, compared to the other relations, you're going to have to mark it quite a bit lower. Next, to move on to is Teradava. Now, Teradava is a very weird one. Um, Saradava is going to give you, um, it's, it's the same as the other Eastern um, Buddhist religions. The issue is, unlike a minus, 10 idea, minus 5 idea cost, it can give you minus 10 advisor cost. It's not bad, advisor cost stacking can go quite far, and be, if that 10% advisor cost lets you run an extra advisor, you'll basically get an extra pip, even though, again, it's going to cost you a bit of money still. So it's not that bad of a modifier, but I have been, I have been quite harsh to minus 10 advisor cost because there's better ways of stacking it and getting 10% from your religion. So for that reason alone, I'm a bit skeptical on it overall. 
it's just there's better options around you and for me honestly a lot of the buddhists really need a rework there's that just not that many mechanics for them like what you get the emerald buddha and you get a couple monuments and that's about it there's just a lot of better religions out there and i mean even fetishists if you work for it end up with a lot more buffs than Theradava ever would so for me Theradava certainly is above animist and detail but it doesn't really go above that i'm afraid now we move on to totemist not zoroastrian um Right, so Totemist is the other Native American faith, if you are just a, uh, if you're one of the migratory ones. So it's not that bad overall. Well, sorry, that was a completely wrong, it is very bad. But at least compared to Animist, it has some things going for it, although those things aren't, there's not many things going for it, I think is the best way of putting it. Putting it. Now, Totemist has a bug that has not been fixed to this day. And I was under the assumption it got fixed. And this bug makes it a lot stronger than it should be. And that bug allows you to take the ancestor traits multiple times. However, because it's an unintended bug that's intended to be fixed, I'm going to be counting as an exploit and hence assuming you can't use it. If you are using the totemist bug for multiple ancestors of the same thing for modified stacking, then immediately shoots totemist up into the top of B tier, if not A tier. My issue is, is that that is a, exploiting a bug in unintended game mechanic, and hence it's an exploit. If you play Totemist legitimately, you very quickly run into problems. Namely that, okay, you've got your plus 5 discipline person. You probably haven't even sight. If you're playing legitimately, you're probably not even burning to get a strict uh, ancestor. So it's quite unlikely you get him. And what, you're able to basically build your own religion over venerating three ancestors? It takes you a while to do that, so there's a bit of a time commitment. But at least the buffs you do get from it are quite reasonable. You have to pick up minus two unrest, you have to get minus three construction costs, you have to get five discipline again. Ten good producers on the table, ten trade efficiency on the table, a mission is on the table. It's very much a build your own religion. So for that reason alone, I tend to value it quite nicely compared to the other things. In especially as well, because if you do have a reformist ruler, you can get 25% reform progress growth from it as well. And that's quite strong, I find. But if you're not exploiting the bug, it's quite a bit of work, it's quite a bit of work to get there. And the issue with quite a bit of work to get there is, well, if you just don't get a Discipline Ruler, if you don't get strict, there goes your plans getting plus 5 Discipline forever. If you are building around morale, it's only plus 5 morale for Inspiration Leader. Well, that trait, Inspiration Leader, should be blocked at least at 10% morale. At least to plus 10 morale for Inspiration Leader. Plus 5 morale is just not comparable to plus 5 Discipline. Anyway, that's a complete digression. So for me, it's a bit of an RNG-dependent one. At least there's not that many debuffs to it. But again, you're also a native again. You don't have the greatest set of events and monuments given to you, but it's something. You have the pagan ones, so it's there. And the other issue is, unlike the other cults, we have to spend some religious power or some arbitrary thing to get a uh, get the ancestor slots. You have to pay 400 dip points for each one, and that starts to really add up. Obviously, if you're paying 400 diplomatic power for plus five discipline to the end of the game, multiple times, you probably should be doing that. Again, that exploit really keeps Totemist incredibly up in viability. And I do hope that gets fixed, but from, from the best of my knowledge, that is still not fixed to this day. At least I think it's not. It's a bit of a weird one. Um, because it seems to be constantly in a state of being fixed and not fixed. Where I think it's fixed. So I say it's fixed, and all people show me evidence of how to do the exploit now to get multiple, uh, to get multiple trait bonuses. So I'm like, okay, it's not actually fixed. Then people show me how that exploit got fixed, so it's kind of a mini one where it keeps getting fixed and unfixed. So I'm not even sure if it is fixed in that status. So for that reason alone, I'm going to be assuming it's not fixed. You can only get it once. And for that reason, I'm going to be putting Totemist just above Tengri because of its potential and viability. You can get 5 Discipline and so on and so on if you do work for it. But it, the limitations are there and we're assuming the exploit is fixed for the most part. Now we move on to our last, um, our, our last of the... Um, a loss of the religions from the Buddhist group, Theradavra, uh, uh, sorry, Vajrayana. Again, it's it's there. At least it's... Oh, I got the icons wrong. Sorry. That one's meant to be there. You are Theradavra. My bad. Um, you are Vajrayana. That's why I thought it was Theradavra. That is Vajrayana. My bad. Vajrayana has five brown of armies and nothing else going for it. Great. You are basically, again, the previous following all the other Buddhists. You're a, you're a five morale of armies religion. I, that, that's just better options than that, I'm afraid. So for that reason, I'm going to be putting it near the bottom of D tier as well. These religions really need buffs to be competitive in the current scene of all the other buffs. 
Talking of religions that recently got buffs and religions that honestly did not need it, Zorastrian. Now, Zorastrian is a pain I concede to get to. Uh, it only 1.6 exists of it, and it's, whole, it's kind of almost an Easter egg religion. The issue with it, it's good. And it's a very stealth good, because you get access to 10 trade efficiency and 2 chances of the true faith, sure. 10 trade efficiency isn't bad, it's already a decent one right up the, bot uh, right up the open. But you get access to your unique decision for manpower and true faith provinces, which is comparable to the uh, orthodox one. And you have access to pretty much the best discipline out of every religion. You get the Shiravan Monument for 10 discipline. No other religion gives you 10 discipline. Nowhere near that. I know you have to get a monument for it, but we are ranking religions on their full potential. And Zoroastrian's full potential is amazing. Furthermore, if you do go into Persia and you go to do Zoroastrian Persia, you get even more boss from that tree. And that's, those are unique to being Zoroastrian and Persia as well. So there's so much potential in Zoroastrian, and it really becomes quite amazing. I mean, 10 Discipline on its own makes it a really standout religion on its own. For the most part, if you ever go Zoroastrian in single player, you don't need to invest a penny into army quality after that. That is it. 10 Discipline is going to be enough for you to be consistently ahead of the AI. For the most part, you can go ahead and take a Diplomatic Ideas, etc. To get that 10 Discipline, the AI is going to have to take something like quality and economic to just be on par with you of the buffs and that's not even counting the land fire damage you received from the monument as well basically Zoroastrian is really held up by the monument and the fact they got a whole bunch of new buffs as well as good decisions for manpower and tolerance of the true faith etc Zoroastrian for me while I think still behind orthodox does sneak into S tier because of the new DLCM mechanics so there's that right a bit of a weird list um probably a bit controversial as well but again bear in mind that this list is done with the idea of how difficult it is to get this religion is not considered. So even though some religions like Zoroastrian are a lot harder to get, and Norse, if you take into account how difficult it is to get Norse, will be at the bottom of D tier, for example. In terms of how much the buffs the religions provide on their own, I'm reasonably happy with this list. Now again, I would tell you to show me, show me your corrections in the comments, but you're going to do that anyway, so there's no need to ask. But with all that said and done, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.